Welcome all to this ePortfolios for Experiential Learning Guided by Theory Cultivated by Students. We have a very exciting online symposium for the next three hours. But first, we want to clarify that we are recording this session. Uh, we are using the holding slide here to ensure that the academic practice teaching advice notice from Trinity College Dublin host for this event is visible to us all. And the expectation that all recordings from this session will be used for teaching and learning, not edited or modified in any manner, that we remind people, please be mindful of your physical environment and conscious of what might be captured if you happen to be on screen during the recording and to assure you that recorded materials will be handled in compliance with all statutory duties and the university's policies and procedures. Additional to today, but relevant, um, automatic captioning should be active right now. Uh, it certainly is our intention. We will be using breakout rooms during the session. They will not be recorded. During the breakout rooms, which are not onerous and will be completely supported and facilitated, we really encourage you to stay and become involved in them. Uh, we will have a collaborative document under construction, let's call it. That document will remain available via the link to attendees of this session for 24 hours after we complete. And after that, our, our wise uh, keynote speakers and other speakers will probably have a look at it just in case there are pieces that need to be tidied up, but not to change it in any meaningful way. And then we share it with attendees. Um, the recording will be retained as a resource. And while, because we're hosting in Trinity, we refer to Trinity hosting, but it will be openly available um, through and by all the speakers at the event. And of course, because this is an event sponsored by National Forum Vital Week, they will likely also link to it from the National Forum site. And with that said, I'm going to stop sharing for a minute so that Katrina, our wonderful host in the background there, is going to share a national forum. It's just about one minute video, which explains who they are. It's on Valuing Ireland's Teaching and Learning. From the 8th to the 12th November 2021, the higher education community will come together through local and national events to consider how we value teaching and learning and to explore what the future of education could look like for staff and students. The week is a chance for everyone to celebrate and value what matters and to reflect and think about the future. You can get involved by hosting or taking part in an event, sharing your teaching and learning scholarship, contributing to showcase videos, or participating in other vital activities. For more information, see www.teachingandlearning.ie forward slash vital week or follow us on that forum TL. return to our general introductions, you will all have received this outline uh, overview of the event with our keynote speakers, Professor Kathleen Yancey and Professor Tracy Light. And you will be somewhat familiar from what Jade has circulated to us all with the uh, session plan, if you like, for today and our estimated outline of timings and activities. I encourage you, if you choose, please feel free to take a screenshot of that. We'll be doing everything we can to stay on time in so far as we feasibly can. But first, I just want to take a couple of minutes, as it were, to set the context of this, how, how the seed was sown, how we came to be here. And of course, the two key people, Arlene and Alex, two year four students who happened to be undertaking a 16 week experiential learning placement with me as their preceptor. This is a statutory placement and they do it at the first half of their final fourth year of the honours uh, undergraduate degree part of the MPharm programme. My responsibility as a preceptor from the statutory point of view is to effectively 
um, confirm that they've demonstrated a range of behaviors against a competency framework. That's the, the obligatory piece. I'd rather be mentor than preceptor, if you like. And the mentor piece is very much a circle there in red around stu student development through experiential learning. So once we knew Lane and Alex were coming, and I hold a joint position between academic practice and the School of Pharmacy, um, we, we began to brainstorm as to how we might make this meaningful for them. In parallel with the experiential placement, which takes up four days a week, the fifth day is allocated to academic online modules, which run in parallel and from which pharmacy students derive half of the academic credit for the final year. That is 30 CTSs of credit. And the question inevitably arises, is this appropriate? And yes, I have conflict of interest because I've been very much one of the leads in developing co-delivered academic online modules between the universities. But the question inevitably arises, is this the most appropriate way? And Johnny Johnston, who's here with us and probably posting in the chat box regularly as we go. Um, unfortunately for him, I caught him late one evening and said, well, you know, how do you make a portfolio student owned, student centered? And of course, the fact that Johnny is an experienced student mentor, that also led us to really put down 10 points that would be required in order to make it student owned. And straight away, there's this tension as an academic how, if that amount of academic credit aligns with the student portfolio, how do you um, find a way of being able to stand over whether the student has met whatever standard has been put out there? And that led me to contact Ashling Reist, who's one of our speakers today. And I, I want to emphasize this, that ironically, without even thinking about it, Johnny and I set en route to developing a community of query which is what experiential learning is about. We're not experts on e-portfolio, but how could we move the discussion forward in a manageable, effective, meaningful, productive way? So Ashling introduced us to Rob Lowney in DCU. Next thing, the academic practice unit came behind the project very much. And therefore, Katrina, who also has expertise in e-portfolios, came on board, introduced us, of course, to Orna in DCU, and when we had a group like that together, um, why don't you go for the best? And literally by email invitation, immediately both Kathleen and Tracy came on board. So we are absolutely grateful, thankful, excited to know that the title of our series, Guided by Theory, hasn't just begun today. Each of our key presenters have already given a key reading to Lane and Alex, and of course, to the rest of us as well. Cultivated by students, Lane and Alex have already spent a number of weeks thinking about this topic and will present to us today. And of course, ePortfolios for Experiential Learning, which is what today's session is about. So we really welcome you. We hope you enjoy the afternoon and benefit from it. Um, and and we, we really present this as a still evolving community of inquiry into experiential learning. So from profession, Professor Kathleen Yancey's point of view, of course, Kathleen is uh, author of ePortfolios as Curriculum Models and Practice for Developing Student Literacy. Um, she specializes in portfolio theory and practice. Uh, very much um, the value project is at the heart of a lot of Kathleen's efforts in recent decades. And many of you will know that we promote uh, the value rubrics uh, as being very aligned with what we do in academic practice in Trinity. And she is also, of course, also co-editor of 16 scholarly books, among them Reflection in the Writing Classroom and ePortfolio as Curriculum. And directly after Kathleen finishes, Ashling Reist, who is registrar with Hibernia, um, her responsibilities include the oversight of quality assurance, management of assessment and awards. So, again, managing that tension we talk about. And of course, in her prior life, Ashling was director of Appel, which is the organization that would have overseen the matching process between Lane and Alex as students applying for experiential placements and my role in being approved 
um, and then matched with them as a preceptor for the programme. Ashling also uh, was involved in the original development of the e-portfolio that I, as a registered pharmacist, am obliged in law um, to use to evidence my ongoing commitment to continuing professional development. I'm delighted to be here. I want to um, thank the National Forum and Sicily in particular uh, for the invitation. Um, I, it's, it's a wonderful thing to be part of an uh, international uh, symposium uh, that, in, that is centered on but actually includes students. So it's, it's really a treat. Um, my task this morning at about the next uh, 35 to 40 minutes uh, is to think with everyone about how experiential learning uh, can play a role in electronic portfolios. And to do that, um, and my slides are frozen. Um, let's see, we'll, we'll, um, let me try one other thing here. There we go. Uh, we'll take up four tasks. We'll begin by defining e-portfolios because it turns out defining the object in question is a, is a really critical move. Then what we're going to do is locate e-portfolios in what um, I'm calling with some colleagues spheres of activities. And spheres of activities, as we will see, are sites of formal and informal learning. Uh, they include the academic uh, site, uh, work sites, co-curricular sites, internships, and so on. And I'll explain a little bit to you how we came up with this notion and how it might play a role in e-portfolios. Third, uh, we'll look at reflecting uh, in e-portfolios, both on individual pieces of work and on the e-portfolio at large. Um, and then uh, we'll look at designing e-portfolios in two senses, both for the screen and for response. So uh, to begin with um, definitions, I've got three, there, there are many definitions we could draw from. Uh, I'm going to highlight three and you will see that uh, these three show up again and again. Um, uh, as we look at models. We'll be looking at seven models, um, as you'll see. So uh, the first is processes. Um, you know, people often think about e-portfolios as the result of three processes, collection, selection, and reflection. And collection simply means that students are, as it sounds, collecting their work in something of an archive, that, that secondarily they are selecting from that archive. They're not, they're not showing everything that they could show, they're showing some subset. And it's a really good question as to why some pieces are in and why pieces are out and who is making those selections, a point to which we might return in the Q&A. And then last but not least is reflection. There are not a few people think that reflection is actually the heart of any electronic portfolio, but as we're going to see, reflection can take many different forms. And so it's important to identify what it is we actually want students to do when we ask them to reflect. The second point I'll make here is that in the states, what some schools have done has taken up that mantra of collection, selection, and reflection and added something to it that is very important to them that then identifies or brands their e-portfolio effort. So my example here would be LaGuardia Community College and their portfolio is identified as collection, selection, reflection, and connection. Connection being very, very important to them. So you can see how this works as a way of understanding e-portfolios, but also providing a signature to certain e-portfolio models. A second approach um, that I think is uh, very compatible um, with a competency-based framework um, is one oriented to genre or type of text. And a genre approach would identify or define e-portfolios as a collection of texts, different kinds of texts, could be video, could be PowerPoints, uh, could be written text, um, and it could be software and so on, contextualized for a specific purpose and audience. That's pretty easy to see in competency-based models like pharmacy, like teacher education, like architecture. It's sometimes harder to see for models that are not competency-based programmatically, um, but it simply means that, um, and per Sisley's point, when people come together as a community of inquiry, um, it's easier to figure out what that might look like. And then last but not least, we might think of portfolios as one piece of a larger learning ecosystem. 
That involves lots of different kinds of what in the States are called high impact practices, things like uh, placement exercises, undergraduate research and so forth. It's not the only one. Uh, it is one piece in that learning ecosystem, but it's also the case that sometimes the reason people like that particular piece, the e-portfolio, is that it can house all the others. So you can have examples of undergraduate research, you can have examples of experiential learning, you can have ex examples of classroom learning all under one uh, frame that's provided by the e-portfolio. The slide here is intended not for you to look at every single, good news, don't, you don't need to look at every single item, not even every single um, highlighted item, but this is uh, a list of e-portfolio models uh, that are being offered on a single campus in the United States. And that allows me to make the point that there are lots of different kinds of models. If you look at the very top, there's one in American studies that's identified as course organization. That's basically a module. There's one in art history that's capstone integration. That's a very, very interesting model, the capstone integration. I'm going to come back to that one. So you might want to hold on to that because it's not just that it's capstone, it's culminating in somewhat the same way uh, uh, that the student models today are, are um, capstone-like, but it's also that they're integrated. So we'll, we'll look at different kinds of integration. Then the third one there is mentored research, which is something like, again, has, has similarities to what we're looking at today in terms of the pharmacy model. Then the next one is civic learning. So you can see that there are very, very different kinds of models. And um, we won't look at all of them. Of course, there's not world enough in time, but we will look at a couple to try to get a sense of what the range of models looks like and also what they value in those models. But before we do that, I would like to highlight a little bit about what our orientation is when we think about e-portfolios. So one question is whether we're interested in students' development only, whether they're interested in their achievement only, or they're interested in both. Because clearly, if you're interested in achievement only, then you, you don't necessarily have to um, concern yourself with stops along the learning journey. If, on the other hand, you're interested in development as well as achievement, then you really do need to think about, so what are some stops along the learning journey? What kinds of activities can we engage students in? What kind of reflective questions can we pose? So answering that question is really important also for indicating uh, what text you want students to collect. The second orientation, um, and they're not mutually exclusive, they clearly they can work together, is whether the model is school-based only. There are many, many models. I, I would suggest that <laughs> maybe not a majority, but close to a majority of models are school-based only. That's people are very interested in students meeting competencies or standards or outcomes, however you want to frame it. And so they're looking at school activity. But within the last, I'd say, um, eight years or so, and we have people with us today, um, uh, Tracy is one, uh, Lisa is another who, can, who or, uh, can comment on this as well, quite knowledgeably. I'd say within the last year, uh, eight years or so, around, certainly around the States, but also around the world uh, more generally, um, uh, people interested in e-portfolios have been interested in, in integration. Now, I've separated integration in lower case from integration in larger case. And, and the reason is that there are some models that are integrated in a very small kind of way. And I don't mean that as a negative or a pejorative. It's just that integration is sort of understood as an embellishment. It's not really the main course. There are other models that are fully integrative. And in fact, they require integration. And you're going to see some of those. And that's why I've got the upper case there. So when we say integration, we really have to pause and say, what do we mean by integration and how integrative do we want it to be? And then last but not least is experiential, which is what we're principally interested in today. So is it experientially focused? Like, are we really just interested in the experience all by itself, sort of in isolation, which we might, there are reasons we might want to do that. Or is it really more experientially integrated? That is integrated with other sites of learning, other spheres of learning, or is it both? So the orientation that we take will have everything to do with the model we design. And now before, I, I need us to go back for just a minute. Before, um, let's see if we can, can we make, can we go back? Yeah, we wanna go back and we wanna go back one, there we go. So um, 
uh, one more thing before we look at models it has to do with spheres um, as sites of formal and informal learning. And here I'm drawing on a research project that <laughs> happily enough involves Ireland. <laughs> so it's a, it's a research project looking at sites of writing for students, college level students. Um, it includes four, peoples in, four people in the States, uh, my colleagues, Alexis Hart, Ashley Holmes, and Anna Knudsen. Actually, Anna has just moved to Canada, so she was in the States, she's now in Canada. Uh, Ilya Sullivan, who is uh, at Limerick, and Yogesh Sunya, who is uh, in Oman. And what we were interested in uh, was learning from students about the spheres in which they write and the connections they see across them. So you can see uh, that we've defined spheres of writing as circumstances and occasions for writing. And we operationalized or defined potential spheres as self-motivated, that's one. So something you will do on your own, you're in complete control of, doesn't belong to school or to anybody else. Co-curriculars, student government, for example, um, could, be, could be athletic teams. Internships, which I think that's probably like placement, uh, pretty much like what we're looking at today with the pharmacy model. Workplaces, which uh, refers to sites of work that students are engaged in while they're in college. Civic or community spaces, academic classrooms, and then other spheres, which was to capture anything that we had not captured for students. Now, what we found, we, we surveyed uh, over 200 students. We interviewed uh, 23 across all six campuses. And we found that every single student writes in at least two spheres. And most of them write in three or more. And if they're learning, if they're writing in those spheres, they're also learning in those spheres. And the other thing we did was we asked them to map those spheres and to show relationships between them. Now, the map you have before you, <clears throat> excuse me, is one that was created by a student on my campus. Uh, the circle um, in the upper left um, is her uh, school uh, writing. But you can see that she has four other spheres and that she sees multiple connections across them. And that's what an integration with uppercase levels might look like from the student's perspective. So that's, so thinking of integration as, as spheres of formal and informal learning gives us another way to think about um, students learning and how it might be represented in the portfolio. And, and you'll see that going forward. So last but not least, before we look at the models, design. So we are gonna look at design as a visual practice and I'm gonna suggest five strategies that I think you will find to be helpful. But before that, I wanna look at a second sense of design, which is design as a means of addressing an audience. Um, and when we think about addressing an audience, we do that in the context of a purpose. There might be multiple purposes. It might be in, informing someone or persuading or demonstrating that you've met competencies or interacting with people in the context of the portfolio or inviting. I don't think it can do all of those things, but I think thinking about what that purpose is, is, is fundamental. And then that leads to some of the kind of features that you might have in an e-portfolio. For instance, are you going to have an email? Are you going to provide an email to someone's, to a sort of general audience so that they all can contact you after reading your portfolio? Because this is actual, you know, a portfolio is actually a social document. So, so there's, you want there to be some engagement around it. Do you want to provide an email that's really key to specific questions that someone might have? Let's say you're, you're involved in undergraduate research or you're involved in a particular placement at a particular kind of pharmacy. Do you wanna welcome questions key to those activities? Are you looking for certain contributions to work that you're taking up? Are you gonna provide a schedule of updates and say, well, here's my portfolio today and I'm gonna be updating it three months from now. I hope you'll return and visit. Are you gonna create links to a blog that you might keeping or a links to LinkedIn um, identity? So, Thinking about all this ahead of time will assure that you'll have an intentionally designed um, portfolio. So let's look at a couple of models here, seven to be specific. So this is the first one that comes out of the model, collection, selection, reflection, and connection out of um, LaGuardia. And uh, it's basically an integration light is what I would say. It's really focused on um, school. And you can see that when you look at the tabs across the top, which are um, the one that gets the most attention, I can tell you, having looked at a lot of these portfolios, is the one that has classes. 
that's where most of um, uh, the files are. But the students are encouraged, especially on the About Me page, which is the page you're looking at now, to include something about themselves. Um, and this student has clearly done that by highlighting, for, ex highlighting, for example, his, his leadership roles. Uh, he tells you that he's a criminal justice major. He also includes a famous quote. I'm not sure entirely why, but I can tell you that in lots and lots of models, students include famous quotes. The, the famous quotes seem like intellectual or professional load stars for students or touchstones. So that is a way of personalizing an electronic portfolio in a very small way that is meaningful, however, to students. The next model comes out of Stanford, and it is um, an integratively focused model. So it's a, it's a science communication model. Every student who participates in this model is majoring in science. So you won't see any philosophy majors, you won't see any engineering majors, you're only gonna see science majors of various kinds. And all of them are interested in communication. So this model operates at the intersection of science and communication. And the students are invited as part of the design process to think about all the connections they can make um, in their intellectual journey. And they're invited to map those. And you can see some of those here. So, this particular student is a human biology major. Uh, she also has volunteered um, uh, at a free clinic in uh, Mexico. So you can see she's got a health uh, interest there. Uh, she took a nutrition class at Stanford, uh, which as she says in the arrow above, taught me the relationship between nutrition and environmental science, which you wouldn't have seen that otherwise. You, you might see the nutrition class would teach her about nutrition, you'd expect that. But the connection to environmental science, you wouldn't know unless she told you. That's what this mapping exercise allows her to do. She also is very interested, you can see, in food security and social determinants of health. So that tells you that she's also interested in a policy angle on this particular topic. Uh, and then I'm just going to follow a couple of arrows. She has a passion for working with mothers and children, which we could connect to her volunteer work earlier. That leads her to take a class in psychology at Stanford. That leads her to think about the intersection between medicine and cultural bioethics. And that leads to a volunteer work as a coordinator of the Stanford Immersion um, on medic Medicine Series. So you can see how it's not just integration of two pieces, it's also a mapping of how they occur over time and what those connections are. That's a very focused, integrative kind of model. A third model comes out of Texas uh, a and and San Antonio, which has a predominantly Hispanic population. This model is very different. It's progressive over the four years. And the idea is that students will be introduced to a theme um, in each year. The first theme um, is welcome to college, where students learn about college because these are, this is an effort in your context of at widening participation. These are largely first generation college students. Um, and so they don't necessarily know from their own family backgrounds about college and the first year is spent learning about college. The second year is learning about the world and volunteering actually. So learning about the world includes volunteering work. The third world, uh, third is learning about the discipline and the fourth is learning about the career. So that's a different kind of integrative cohort based model that happens over the four years of the undergraduate education. I'm, I'm not persuaded that this is something that will necessarily be of interest to this particular audience today, but I thought you might wanna see it just as a point in contrast. The next one might be of interest to you, uh, especially because they do some very interesting things in this model. This model comes out of the University of, um, uh, of Albany, and it has uh, four structural features to it. It begins with a seminar in the first year, which is taken at the same time that students take um, a writing class. Students in this model have to choose coursework from two pathways. Those are the, the green dots before you. And, but it culminates in a capstone. And the capstone is really important and interesting. So I wanna spend a little time looking at that. And there are uh, two buckets here in terms of points I wanna make. The first is that it is, it is not only open to all spheres, students are required, as you're going to see in just a moment, students are required uh, to include spheres beyond school. 
If they don't do that, uh, they cannot pass this and this is a requirement. The second point I'll make is that for this model, students have to write a learning philosophy statement, which as far as I'm aware is the only one of its kind, period, um, end stop. It is, its analog is a teaching philosophy statement that staff will be very familiar with because many staff have created one. Um, students have not, but they are asked to create in this context, a learning philosophy statement. And then the last item here that is particularly important is that failure is actually included as an option. Uh, it's not the only one of its kind, but that's pretty rare. Now, what does that mean? What that means is that in an effort to meet outcomes, and the outcomes are before you uh, along the left axis, so uh, connecting um, relevant experience and academic knowledge is one competency, having multiple sources of evidence is another, a sense of self as an evolving learning is a third. So you can see all of those are on the left-hand side. Um, but um, what students in, in providing all this evidence and reflection, they are allowed to say, in meeting this outcome, I had difficulty. And in fact, I had such difficulty, I failed. Now, can they give you a whole portfolio of failure? No, that would be ill-advised. It cannot be all failure. But the fact that they include failure, I mean, it's, in, it's interesting and provocative. It's interesting because we know that a lot of learning comes out of failure. But in our models of learning in the school context, we do not provide for that. In fact, we penalize people for failing. So it's interesting that failure here is welcomed. And how, how one recovers from failure, what, what meaning you make of failure is very much a part of this model. Um, so that this model is, I think, very interesting. The, the two other things um, I'd like to point out here are um, in, the, in the top uh, competency, where experience and academic knowledge is required, students have to include other spheres. It cannot be only the academic, they have to go to the other spheres and talk about the relationship between learning in those spheres and the academy. And the second item at the, at the close to the bottom has to do with the use of multimodality. That is students are supposed to use the digital platform and all of its affordances, all of its capabilities to make the best case for their learning journey. And that's really interesting because a lot of, a lot of e-portfolio models don't don't attend to digitality at all. This model does. And in part, one of the reasons this model does is that this model hopes that students will become global citizens. And in order to become a global citizen, you have to have a reasonable level of technological expertise is the, is the logic behind it. Um, this is yet another model. I think that we're on number four now. Uh, this is uh, from Loyola of Chicago, which is a Catholic uh, institution in Chicago. It operates out of a center for experiential learning. So it's all about experiences. Students do not have to engage in this, but they, if they want to, they basically sign up for a module. Uh, they can do any number of uh, uh, experiences. They tend to be oriented to social justice because that's the Loyola mission. So that's what um, Loyola wants students to get out of these experiences. And those, those, can be, um, those can be a sort of habitat for humanity trip to a, a country like, like Haiti that needs earthquake relief, or it could be something um, in, a, in a local community in Chicago where uh, there's ample need as well. What's interesting about this model, um, uh, the two things in particular. One is that the students come to it thinking that they basically have to meet expectations or don't meet expectations, hopefully meet them. But you'll notice that there's a number three here for exceeds expectations. So there's a kind of um, above the standard option here uh, that students I'm told find quite motivating. The, the second thing that is very interesting is that the uh, level of awareness and or the level of action that's required and exceeds expectations means that students are taking what they're learning and they're applying. So in, if you look at, um, for instance, synthesis, through reflection, which is the first item. Uh, students demonstrate a clear connection between the in-class and out-of-class components. So again, experiential, integrated, and integrated in a particular way. And it demonstrates exceptional insight in meaningful reflection upon the experiences. 
So here, it's not just insight, it's exceptional and meaningful reflection. The second item, which is related experience to development. So you see they're interested in both development and achievement here. Uh, so again, relative to our orientation. So clearly articulates how the engaged learning experience contributed. And here you see, again, multiple spheres, intellectual, personal, professional, and or civic and demonstrates exceptional insight in meaningful reflection upon the experiences. So here, the first item is really oriented to the connection between school and experience. The second is much more spheres open. The third is the most interesting because that's where students are invited to act, to take action. Demonstrates how the engaged learning experience has helped put into action Loyola's mission to expand knowledge uh, in the service of humanity through learning, justice, and faith. So that's really interesting because when you look at outcomes and competencies, sometimes students are asked to, to um, identify and locate certain, certain behaviors, but, but they're not always asked to do that as a consequence of a particular activity. And here, that's the case. Uh, this particular model is from St. Olaf. It's, it's I'm including it here, although again, it's a very unusual kind of model because it's a self-designed major. Students create a self-designed major that occurs at the intersection of two fields. So earth science and mathematical modeling, for example, that's a, a real example. Um, but what's interesting here are the outcomes that they have. Um, and again, you'll see here, students are again being um, defined as active agents. So the, the first thing that students have to do is um, recognize connections, be reflective about intellectual and personal growth, build intellectual community, and build bridges to communities outside the academy. Now, I've highlighted building a building because that's where students have to do something, not just learn, not just show us that they've learned, but they have to do something on top of that. And what's also interesting is the definition they provide for this portfolio. Now, to my understanding, this is the most technologically savvy set of outcomes for ePortfolios that I've seen to date. That doesn't mean there are others out there that, that don't um, equal this or surpass it, but this is the one I'm, that I'm aware of. And it, it points out some things we might wanna be aware of, it, quite apart from the, the technology that we'll get to that. First of all, the quality of the individual pages is as important as the meaningful coherence of the whole. So each individual page is important as well as, as the whole. It's also the case that they're interested in the clarity and the logic of the overall design. So again, to our point about design, this needs to be intentional and well-designed. The extent of the portfolio matters. If it's too humble, too modest, then it's not going to be sufficiently extensive. If it's overly ambitious, it's probably not gonna be done well. So the extent of the portfolio needs to be, as we would say in rhetoric, chirotic um, or appropriate. Um, the portfolio's overall aesthetic quality matters, but I'll point out that aesthetics really is a function of discipline. The aesthetics for pharmacy would not be the same as the aesthetics for mechanical engineering would not be the same as the aesthetics for philosophy. So it's unlikely you would get a general aesthetic um, it's more likely it will be a function of uh, the context from which the students are emerging. The creativity and thoroughly of the, uh, thoroughness of the links. This model has described itself as being very linky because it understands links as being sites of connection and it's very interested in connections. So the linkiness matters. The degree to which the rationale for particular links is explicit and sensible, so they're not random and the critical judgment apparent in the selective of external sites. That's another important feature because often e-portfolios are not connected to external sites. They're sort of, they might be housed in a platform, but it's really a sort of um, uh, self-identified platform. This one requires that students have other external sites that they link to. But again, it can't be random. It has to be intentional and meaningful and contribute to the overall e-portfolio. And the last one here is a portfolio module. And it comes out of the University of Virginia. You can see that the module is called, um, well, you could see, but I <laughs> just passed it. So I'll try to go back here. Um, 
uh, the uh, portfolio module is called uh, Collect, Select, and Reflect. So again, back to our theme about processes. Um, and this, this module is really about portfolio making this. How do you make a portfolio? And so in order to help students learn about portfolio making this, students are asked to create three separate portfolios. One that's a learning portfolio, one that's a presentational portfolio, much more oriented to sort of competency kinds of portfolios, and one is an exploratory portfolio. So the way spheres of, of learning are handled here is in by dividing the portfolios up into different kinds. And uh, then at the end of each of these portfolios, the students create a set of outcomes or criteria uh, that are used to evaluate the portfolios. And you can see some pant samples there. But the other point I wanna make here is that you can see that it says, uh, finally, uh, we just, uh, we, it says, finally, uh, you will present the portfolio to invited guests at the end of the semester. That's a really important point. That is also a feature of the Stanford Science Communication Model, that they present it to a group of invited guests. And in fact, the students are required to invite the guests. It turns out not every portfolio model has a showcase event or an audience-oriented event, but many of them do. And almost all the programs where students flourish have such an event. And just as we have such an event today, where students will present two portfolios to us. Uh, it's a learning opportunity for students, obviously, but it's really a learning opportunity for us. Uh, so it's a shared learning opportunity. So now I wanna think a little bit about um, reflection. Not nearly enough, uh, but I, at least enough to, to get us started. And people in ePortfolio are, are very fond, I have to say, uh, almost universally, of a, of a definition of, port, of reflection that is informed by John Dewey's work, the, the educational philosopher John Dewey. So four criteria. Reflection is a meaning-making process. It's systematic, rigorous, and disciplined. It happens in community to the point that Cicely made early on and it requires attitudes that value the personal. So it's like critical thinking, but it's from your own orientation. As someone said to me once after um, hearing not one, but two presentations I'd made on Park Parlor, so it took me two to get there. He said to me, oh, I finally get it. Nobody could reflect for me. And I said, exactly. So reflection, it happens in community, but it's a function of the personal. The processes include three important moves. The first thing you do is you occlude the flow of practice. That is, you stop the flow of practice. The second is that you review, often in the company of others, because it's a community-based activity. And third, you explain to others, because in explaining to others, you're really explaining to yourself in a, in a sort of Vygotskyan move. And in doing so, you move from specific to general, using the key terms or vocabulary of the discipline, so as to theorize about what you've learned. Now, that's, that's, a, you know, that's a sort of fundamental way of understanding reflection, but it doesn't tell us what kind of reflection. Reflection takes many, many different forms from metacognition and account of process, the self-assessment generally, or self-assessment in terms of outcomes or competencies, which is what we see in pharmacy and teacher ed. Uh, it could be synthesis, it could be an account of learning, it could be exploration, development of a theory, connection of new and prior knowledge, goal setting. Writing itself, which is a genre. It could be a digitally, digitally mediated discussion. So it can take many different forms. And even, even a program over the four years of an undergraduate program or a combined bachelor's and master's is not likely to be able to include all of these. So a really important question is, which of these facets of reflection are important to a particular program and why? And where will students be invited to engage in those forms of reflection? Now, just to give you two very quick examples. Um, this one comes from a program at the University of Virginia. It's a Spanish program. Uh, this is a capstone kind of portfolio because the students take four modules over two years. They take four modules in Spanish over two years. And, and they build that portfolio over the two years. And here are the outcomes for the portfolio. How did you become a better Spanish speaker, writer, listener, reader? That's one. So a communicator of various kinds. Second, a culturally aware global citizen. 
And third, a proficient user of digital media. So that's what they're looking for in this capstone. Um, you can see at the bottom that they're very interested in community. They ask students to think about what ways uh, they changed um, themselves or impacted others. So they're interested in community interaction. They're interested in connections between learning in the course and other personal and academic interests. Again, spheres of learning. Why did you make the choices of digital media that you made? And can you talk about the development of your digital literacy? So from an orientation point of view, this one is clearly developmental, but also achievement oriented. It's a both and kind of model. So look at a very different model. I wanna look at the editing, writing and media major here um, at Florida State. All students in this major have to do an internship. The internships can run the gamut. Um, they can do an internship for an online museum. They can, they can uh, do a writing internship for the New York Post. Uh, they can work for a public relations firm that specializes in helping homeless teenagers. And all of those are real examples. And you can see that they do very different kinds of things. I'll, I'll, at the end of that internship, students have to create a portfolio. And I have to say that the reflection in that portfolio, and I, I, I have been part of this program, reflection in that portfolio was very disappointing. And here's why. This is what we got. Now, we're telling students now, don't do this, but this is, in fact, what we got. That's how we knew what to tell them not to do. It should not be a description of day-to-day -day activities. It should not be an evaluation of your internship site or supervisor. It should not be a recommendation to other students. It is not a laundry list of items you completed. It's not a checkout list. It's not a superficial account of the semester, and it's not a work log. So those are all the things it's not, which begs the question, what is it? And that was on us. We had not defined it very well. Um, and now it's, you'll see it's very focused. It's very integrative. And this is what students are asked to do. The first thing we do is we tell them how long it has to be. Not, not a precise word count, but a range. This is, in order to do this task well, you're going to need basically this number of words. And then we give them a set of five questions oriented to their internship experience and how that relates to what they have done in school and what it means for their future. So you can see the first question asked about similarities between school and the internship. The second asks about differences. And in each case, they have to include a text from the internship that shows a similarity and shows a difference. The third question has to do with now their definition of writing on the basis of having had this experience. Then we go to spheres of learning. How did the internship affect your personal, intellectual, civic, or professional development? And then at the end, most important in some ways, how have you already used or how will you use what you learned in the future? That's really important. One thing that we know about reflection is that it's very important in understanding the past, but it's at least equally important in understanding what you'll do in the future. Reflection is actually much more future oriented than it is past oriented. So that's something else that this particular set of guidelines helps students understand. And very quickly, uh, because my time is about up, um, if not a little over, uh, design. So we've talked about design for response, peer review, for instance, uh, making certain kinds of invitations, inviting certain kinds of responses, but also strategies for the screen. And very quickly, uh, here are five um, that you might consider um, sharing with students. First thing is to review portfolios themselves. If you haven't seen a couple of them, it's, it's just harder to understand what they are. So look at them because when you look at them, you will see available designs. Uh, you will see features that are included in them and it allows students to say, oh, I like this, I wanna do this, I don't like this and here's why. So it stages a really, really interesting discussion. Um, so you've already identified features. You're going to consider, the, portfolios are in a visual medium. This is a visual medium. So you need to think about possible visuals, about a color scheme, a font style, photos of visual metaphors. Those are, those are critical. Uh, you're looking at and you're looking through. So looking at matters and explaining the logic. So what is the logic of the choices you're making relative to the representation of yourself? That's important, it's a digital identity, you as a professional, let's say, but also once you want the reader to understand about you. So thinking in those terms is really important. Arrange multiply. 
What that means is, and I've done this, I've, this is part of a module that I have offered, uh, a one credit module for students. And what I ask students to do is to create at least two arrangements for their portfolios, because in, in making different arrangements, first of all, they see different possibilities, but second of all, they learn things, they see things they hadn't seen before. So it's another moment of learning and it helps them get to the final arrangement. And then of course, share it with someone new. Before you share it broad scale, share it with somebody new who doesn't know you necessarily well, who didn't see you in this process, and who then tells you how well it's working for them. Uh, so this, the whole process of peer review that we use in other kinds of projects is important here as well. In sum, an ePortfolio then is a set of texts assembled for a specific purpose and audience through the processes of collection, selection, reflection, and design. Those texts obviously come from different spheres or locations, depending on the model. So how many, which ones, and the kinds of connections students make are very important factors in thinking about the model uh, that we want to implement. As is the orientation. Are we more interested in development, achievement, or both? Do we want a school-based model, one that's lightly integrated or one that's fully integrated, including failure? What does experiential look like? Is it really experientially focused in the way that the editing, writing, and media is? Is it experientially integrated, more like the L'Oreal model, or is it really both? And for all that you've done to listen, um, thank you very much. There's a little time for- Everybody can see my slides and hear me. If any, yes, great. Okay, well, that's brilliant. Okay, well, listen, delighted uh, to be speaking with you, everybody. Um, uh, and I suppose what I'm going to be looking at is, is the application of quality principles to assessment design. And I'm also looking forward to gathering a little bit of your own thoughts about how these principles can be applied in the context of e-portfolio use in experiential learning placements. So I know Cecily has, I suppose, given you a little bit of a whistle stop tour, but I'm definitely the only, I think, really non ePortfolio expert in the room uh, today. So I thought what would be useful is to, is to give you a, a little bit of a sense of the context. I'm a bit of a jack of all trades and master of none on today's topics. But uh, where I suppose my perspective comes from is that I've been, uh, I'd be drawing on a few things. First of all, as director of the Irish Institute, uh, sorry, director of operations at the Irish Institute of Pharmacy, um, with that fantastic team, I managed the development of a new ePortfolio that was going to be used by all pharmacists in Ireland and it is now used by pharmacists in Ireland for CPD recording and in fact facilitates a system whereby all pharmacists participate in an e-portfolio review process once every five years and like Cecily I too am a pharmacist so I am required to participate in this process so that means we're e-portfolio users as well. Um, my experience in experiential learning comes from my time as director of APEL um, which is the national body that oversees pharmacy student placements for the three schools of pharmacy at Trinity RCSI and UCC and it's lovely to see some colleagues from Appel on today's uh, call today as well um, and in fact two of our student speakers um, have been placed in their placements by Appel so we, it, we will speak to them later on today and finally as Ceci says I'm currently the registrar at Hibernia College with responsibility for oversight of assessment and quality assurance uh, and in that role I also advise in relation to programme design and academic integrity so given that I suppose that breadth of perspectives I'm going to try and present some considerations when planning e-portfolio use and then ask you to consider how you could uh, I suppose apply some of those principles um, to designing an e-portfolio assessment in an experiential learning placement. So a good place to start when looking at the application of quality principles and assessment uh, as design is, is QQI's assessment and standards. And this document outlines a number of key quality assurance principles under six themes. And I'm going to look at each of those six themes briefly in, in turn. The first theme sets out that learners are responsible for demonstrating their learning achievement. So how do we support them to do this? This includes them striving for academic integrity. So the kind of things that we might want to think about are, does e-portfolio use in itself as an assessment tool inherently support academic integrity due to the typically more authentic nature of a submission? Can e-portfolio also overtly support academic integrity? For example, in the case where the portfolio can be used to describe how an artifact within it was created. How do we ensure that our students have the academic integrity skills that are specifically needed for ePortfolio? So, for example, referencing and copying right of videos, which might be different to, to what they're doing in a typical assessment. And also, how do you manage the integrity of the assessment record when using an editable ePortfolio? 
Our second theme is assessment support standards based on learning outcomes. So related to this, we need to think about how the e-portfolio assessment will support our learners to demonstrate attainment of the prescribed learning outcomes and in turn, how we support our learners in this regard and what will that support look like? Is it a detailed assessment brief? So Kathleen has just shown us a, an example of what that might look like. Are there specific technical supports required for these students to engage with e-portfolio? Could you, in fact, think about structuring the e-portfolio to inherently support users? So, for example, the pharmacist CPD portfolio is a very highly structured e-portfolio with the aim of inherently supporting users to demonstrate that they're meeting requirements. But of course, this also has an impact on learner autonomy. Team, team three sets out that assessment promotes and supports both effective learning and teaching. So this includes that assessment should be planned and coordinated across modules and programmes. So we need to think about how an e-portfolio assessment aligns with the programme assessment strategy. For example, does it create an assessment burden or pinch point? And when describing this principle, QQI also set out the very important role of formative feedback. So again, that's something we need to think about how we're going to incorporate within an e-portfolio assessment. Our fourth principle is that assessment procedures are credible. So this includes that the assessment is fair, consistent, valid and reliable. And QQI said that a fair assessment should be unbiased. No particular person or group should be unfairly advantaged or disadvantaged. So when we're designing an assessment, we need to consider, does the design offer an even playing field to all students? Or will students, for example, on a particular type of placement or with access to particular IT tools be advantaged in undertaking the assessment? What skills are going to be required by the students and staff to engage with the e-portfolio assessment? And are these skills expectations reflected in the learning outcomes or are they reflected in the program entry requirements? Consistency is also a tenant of credibility. Now, this can be challenging, but not impossible to achieve in an assessment that provides greater learner autonomy. So how will you balance autonomy with consistency of assessment? Validity, as we all know, is always a key consideration in assessment. And QQI sets out that it means that it allows inference of the attainment of the learning outcomes it purports to address. So this links strongly to the purpose of the e-portfolio. And Kathleen has spoken about the purpose of the e-portfolio quite a bit in her presentation today. An experiential learning context, we might be intending to assess competence. So how will this be achieved? In the e-portfolio for pharmacists, for example, every cycle or activity links back to a set of competencies as one mechanism of linking competence to the activities within the portfolio. And finally, in relation to credibility, how reliable is your assessment? Can you have confidence in the result? Will you need to employ additional methods to increase reliability? So, for example, double marking or incorporating additional assessment tasks. And in the context of an e-portfolio, are such measures acceptable and feasible? And how will they impact on student and assessor burden? Our fifth principle is that assessment methods are reviewed and renewed as necessary to adapt to evolving requirements. So what mechanisms will you employ to review an e-portfolio assessment in an experiential learning context? Is there a role for placement supervisors or preceptors within this quality review? And our final principle, learners are well informed about how and why they are assessed. And QQI also set out that fairness requires transparency of assessment processes. And it's essential that learners are informed about the precise criteria that will be used to assess them. So how can you ensure that all students clearly understand what's expected of them and how they will be assessed? And I know Lisa and colleagues at ePortfolio Ireland have some excellent resources in relation to assessment rubrics on the ePortfolio Ireland website. So that might be a nice place to, to start. In addition to sectoral standards, a number of professional programmes will have requirements set out by professional statutory and regulatory bodies. And today, as we're going to spend some time focusing on pharmacy student placements, I've included just some of the assessment standards from the Pharmaceutical Society of Ireland. So these include some standards which relate to those we've already spoken about. So things like clearly defined marking criteria, formative assessment, effective and timely feedback and provision of clear guidance to students. But in addition, themes such as accounting for patient safety and attainment of competence are included. 
and in many professions and organizations, competency frameworks set out the knowledge, skills and behaviors that practitioners or professionals require to undertake their role or profession. An assessment of these competencies is often a regulatory requirement for professional programs of education. So again, looking at the education of pharmacists, the legislation actually sets out that no master's degree in pharmacy shall be awarded to any person unless the head or acting head of the School of Pharmacy has confirmed the satisfactory de demonstration of the competencies by the person as set out in the core competency framework for pharmacists. And in fact, this competency framework is also a key foundation for pharmacists lifelong learning with further legislation requiring that every pharmacist shall on a regular basis carry out a self-assessment of his or her learning needs having regard to the core competency framework for pharmacists with a view to identifying learning activities. Dr Light is going to look at some competency assessment in more detail this afternoon later on in her session so hopefully that that background will be a little bit helpful. There is an absolute breadth of additional quality assurance considerations when looking at the design of e-portfolio assessment. And although today we can't examine them all, a particular in few came up as we started to prepare our discussions for today's event. Firstly, looking at quality assurance itself. How does the assessment facilitate internal and external assessment validation? So, for example, your moderators, your external examiners, how are they going to engage with this assessment? And a really interesting question is, can an e-portfolio assessment actually contribute to your quality assurance validation and accreditation processes? For example, by helping you to show impacts in areas that other assessment types just simply don't. Another question is who owns the e-portfolio? If it's owned by the institution, can students access it after the course? Can they share access? Can it be locked? And how does all of this impact on academic integrity, learner autonomy and acceptability? Policies and procedures in relation to data protection will vary between institutions, but if a new tool or process is being used, the need for a data protection impact assessment should be evaluated. Data protection principles such as transparency and fairness should be considered. So, for example, how students are made aware of how their data is being processed, where the data will be stored, retained and disposed of. And a, a really interesting question, I think, is are you going to need specific data protection guidelines for students in the context of an e-portfolio for experiential learning placement. So, for example, could they include personal data of others within their e-portfolio? And how do you manage that? And are there ways to incorporate universal design for learning principles to support learner diversity? And if reasonable accommodations are required, can these be provided? And I haven't even touched on the tenants of excellent web portfolios that Kathleen outlined earlier. Well, so we have discussed a huge variety of considerations and yet seemingly only touched the surface. Um, on first appearance, this could really look like a, a quite a complex matter, but my experience has been that simplicity and structure are the key to overcoming much of this complexity, setting clear requirements and expectations, providing transparency and sharing well-developed assessment rubrics. There's a lot to balance. And I think one of the particular balances that can be most difficult can be balancing academic rigor and student autonomy and I love this quote um, from the, the blog below which is there's one dilemma the teacher needs to strike a balance between a rigorous assessment with the prescribed outcome and a clear assessment rubric and providing students with the freedom and flexibility to express themselves so if anybody knows quite how to get that perfectly right we, we look forward to hearing from you and I do suspect this is a theme that we will return to uh, again later today. And thank you all very much for your time. Uh, just some references there. Most of them are related to, the, the I suppose, the, the, the pharmacy world and, and some of the, the legislation and guidelines in the way, the QQI assessment and standards. And thank you, Cecily, for for, qualify, for uh, clarifying the QQI are uh, the, the regulatory body in the space uh, within Ireland, the Quality and Qualifications Ireland. And also, I've just popped up the, the reference in relation to the, the paper that we published on the e-portfolio uh, for pharmacists that we established in Ireland. So uh, just to thank everybody for their time and uh, Again, I, I, if anybody has any questions later on today, I look forward to, to receiving them. Thank you. Great pleasure. We have another keynote speaker in Professor Tracy Penny Light. Uh, Tracy is Professor and Director of Leadership and Excellence in Academic Development at St. George's University. She's also President of the Association, am I correct, uh, for Authentic Experiential and Evidence Based Learning. Uh, which is an international e-portfolio community of practice. 
We are deliberately referring to ourselves as a community of inquiry today, because while we've experts with us, we're not all claiming to be at that stage. Um, you're also author of Electronic Portfolios and Student Success uh, with Helen Shen and Documenting Learning with ePortfolios, a guide for college instructors. Well, with that level of expertise behind you and what we've got to know of you over the last six or eight weeks, um, we all look forward to the next keynote by Tracy Penny Light. Many thanks. Thanks so much, Cicely. Thanks to you and to the National Forum for the invitation. I love Ireland and I'm really glad to be here with you all and have really enjoyed over the last several weeks thinking about this particular session and what I might offer um, as food for thought for you to consider as you're exploring the use of ePortfolios for experiential learning, um, and in particular in the context of pharmacy, but I've also worked with students across the disciplines. And so um, what I'm gonna argue today is that um, it is really important to make portfolios personal. And, you know, we, we've been talking about addressing competency frameworks, and of course we want to do that. The portfolios that I've seen from students where they really begin to understand themselves and they leverage their own experiences in service of their ability to demonstrate that they have met the learning outcomes or have developed a, a set of competencies to me is the most powerful thing. And so I'm, I'm gonna to suggest to you that um, if we can incorporate that in some way, that's really important. Of course, all of the issues that Ashling just raised are things that we need to consider. So this is not an easy task, but um, hopefully give you some ideas of ways that you might do this in your context. So I'll just talk really briefly about the implement, uh, implementation framework that Helen, John and I created in the work that we've done in our publications and try to connect that a little bit to the core competencies in this case for pharmacy, but we could think about core competencies in lots of other spaces. Um, think a little bit about the affordances of ePortfolios. So Kathy's already kind of primed us for that thinking. And I'll be thinking about, about those in particular to the connection to professional identity development, um, some of the ways that you might generate evidence of your ability to meet those outcomes while also integrating that with your professional identity and, and encourage you to really start thinking about what your story of learning is and how you might represent that story in your portfolios. You might guess um, storytelling is another area that I work in and I think that's very, very powerful. So just a very quick overview of the implementation framework that we crafted first in our the book that Helen and I wrote for the Association of American Colleges and Universities and then refined in the book that you see here. Um, we really noticed that when thinking about using portfolios and implementing them in a particular context, that there were several, not steps, but considerations that we, we knew would be really helpful as people were thinking about using portfolios in their own spaces. And you'll see them outlined there on the left-hand side. And of course, we wanna start with outcomes. I think that's you know traditional um, good pedagogical practice to think about, and I love backward design. So always I'm thinking about the outcomes I'm trying to achieve, or in this case, competencies that you want to um, be able to demonstrate. And then you know go to that step of what evidence would we need to see that a learner has met um, the outcomes or achieved the competencies, and then thinking about the learning activities that we might engage them in, in along the way in order to develop um, that set of things. I really want to focus on the idea of, of generating evidence of learning. To me, this is a piece that, and Kathy sort of alluded to it in some of the reflections that students um, complete after being out on internships or experiential placements, you know, and I've experienced this in, in different contexts as well. Often it is, here's what I did on my internship, or here are the various things that I participated in. That's, a, that's fine as a starting point, but really what's the evidence that you achieved what you said you were going to achieve? So if you, you know, are intending to document your ability to work effectively in a team, 
what evidence do you have from that experiential placement that you might put into the portfolio? And again, how do does the fact that you as an individual have that evidence, have generated that evidence, what does that say about your ability to meet the outcomes and to demonstrate competency that might be unique from one of your colleagues? And so, of course, we've got students often undertaking a different type of experiential placement, even within the same program. So those individuals' uh, evidence is going to look different. Um, and, and so it does bring to bear the question, how do we really assess that the students have met the competencies in a way that is fair and equitable um, and consistent, reliable and valid as Ashley pointed out. And I think one of the ways to do that is to really think about and anticipate the external uses of the portfolio. And so Kathy talked a little bit about portfolios for different audiences and different purposes. And I think that's a really important thing to, to consider. And you're gonna hear from Lane and Alex about how they're wrestling with this issue in thinking about who's the audience for their portfolio they have the set of competencies and what are the best way to demonstrate that they've met them in their portfolios. So this is the core competency framework for pharmacists that is uh, that you have in Ireland. And in the experiential placement that Lane and Alex are doing, they're focused in particular on three of these competencies. So the professional practice. So thinking about the evidence that they might generate of their ability to practice patient-centered care, maybe not in their experiential placement at the moment, but um, how can they practice ethically and legally in a teaching and learning space? Of course, that's important. We heard already about academic integrity. How can we engage in appropriate continuing professional development? I think this is a really important one and something that we often at least I have often missed out on in the work with some of my students is really thinking about where can I transfer my learning next and how do I create a professional plan for um, my career development as opposed to a path. So I think traditionally we've talked about career pathways with the idea that it's a very step-by-step -step sequential process and even linear in nature. And in fact, that's not really what most of us experience um, today. And I think probably most of us in this space have not experienced a direct career pathway, but rather we've had a career plan in mind. So we know that there are certain skills, knowledge, abilities that we want to develop. We might have encountered something in our learning career that has really stuck with us. For me, you know, the, the whole idea of working with faculty and colleagues to improve teaching and learning across the disciplines, I would argue that even though I am a historian and I've, I've been a traditional professor, that piece of working with others is really my vocation or my calling. And so when I think about the evidence that I use to document my professional identity within the portfolio, it's very much tied to the core values that I've identified are, you know, no something that I can't live without, you know, they have to be embedded in all of the work that I do in one way or in another. And so if we think about a competency framework, really identifying what is that professional plan, what are the things that are for us as individuals really important and how do we map those onto the competencies that we need to demonstrate for our professional bodies, I think is a really um, interesting space for us to explore in the portfolio um, sort of ecosystem. Personal skills, of course, we're the, those are the traditional things. How do we document our leadership, decision-making, teamwork, et cetera? Um, and then organization and management skills. And so thinking about our roles within the workplace, um, if we're talking about an experiential placement, having our learners to really reflect on what's happening and how they're gonna transfer that knowledge back into an academic context. Um, certainly in my past life, I've worked with students who were on um, cooperative work placements that were embedded within their, their program. And we often did stop to ask the students, how did what you did on your co-op placement connect to what we're talking about in class today? You know, how are we closing the loop for students? It was sort of, you know, send them off on their work placement. They would write that reflective piece at the end, which was very much, here's what I did on my work placement, um, and then come back to class. And we never took it up again. And so I think, especially in professional programs, having that ongoing conversation about how the work that um, students are doing in and beyond the classroom is really important. So again, connecting those formal and informal learning experiences in meaningful ways to the individual. And of course, that's different for, for all of us. 
So if we think about the affordances of portfolios themselves, it, they really are a space that is learner centered. It enables us to identify and represent um, a set of digital artifacts that are authentic to our own learning. And so as um, Lane and Alex, I think have already uh, discovered that how each of them are viewing their placement and thinking about ways to document it is different because they're different individuals. They're unique individuals. They've had different experiences. Yes, they're in the same pharmacy program, but the way that they are thinking about the evidence that they're um, capturing of their learning is needs to be authentic to them. And so the way they represent that is, is going to be different. Um, it ought to be narrative, um, you know, so not surprising, you're, I've already suggested that telling a story of your learning is a really important part of portfolio practice. Um, it has to be reflective, as Kathy has already um, emphasized for us, that ability to think about what we're learning and to plan and um, consider what we'll do next is really important. It ought to be, in my mind, integrative. So that idea that we're making connections between and among our various learning experiences, both formal and informal, should be a piece of the portfolio, or at least the portfolio affords us that opportunity to, to make it very integrative. Um, often portfolios are outcomes or competency oriented, and, and we certainly see that in the case of pharmacy. I teach in a master of education program, same idea. We want to know that students have developed the skills and abilities that will enable them to be successful practitioners once they leave our campuses. And so we can think about the ways that the e-portfolio allows us to have that authentic evidence, but also connected to the set of competencies. And then they often, you know, enable us to represent dispositional or what my friend Susan Kahn talks about as ineffable outcomes, those outcomes that are difficult to really articulate. But when we see them in a portfolio via the evidence, it's really obvious. And so I love that ability of the portfolio to enable the learner themselves to put their own special mark on the learning that's happening within a program or within a certain context. Um, so, you know, thinking about the work in our portfolios as being our stories of professional identity development and how those stories might shift and change over time. I'm imagining in pharmacy that the way that we document a competency at one moment in time is going to look a little different as you have different experiences, as you experience different um, patients and clients, as you understand and disease in different ways, as you work in a community pharmacy, as you have a family, all of these things really help to shape who we are as professionals and inform that development as we move through our learning career. So I think, you know, at, at the heart of, of portfolio practice is this notion of authentic evidence of learning. And again, it, it won't be surprising to that I would say that at this moment in time of the, of the presentation, to me, if the portfolio isn't an authentic representation of the learner and how they're experiencing the curriculum, then it's not really a very successful portfolio. Um, there are lots of models which are very focused on a set of competencies and become really more of a tick box for the students to check, you know, I've met this, I've done that. Um, and we don't really get the same kind of deep understanding of either themselves or the curriculum when it, it is sort of done as a, a tick box. And so really thinking about what, what would compelling evidence of professional identity look like in a particular context to me is a really powerful way of thinking about portfolios. And again, um, sort of capturing all of the various um, as, you know, sort of approaches to portfolios around integrative learning, self-awareness, reflective practice, and metacognition. Uh, so you might just take a moment to reflect for yourself, regardless of whether you're a student anymore or whether you're um, now an academic staff member or a professional in a particular context, where does your evidence of your story of identity and profession exist? What does it look like? And how can you leverage it in service of your own professional development development and also how you can leverage it in the context of developing your own um, career plan, not a path, but a plan that you can, again, begin to make connections between the various um, types of activities that you're engaged in. 
So I think um, at their heart, portfolios are spaces for meaning making. Um, I know that when I work with my students in helping them to think about documenting their learning of the program learning outcomes, that it gives them an opportunity to really wrestle with the way they're experiencing the content, the material, their, their own research, their work in, in practice, and how they can really make sense of that all as they learn new things within a program. And so again, going back to that competency um, framework that we have for pharmacy, where are there places that the learner has an opportunity to really make meaning of the work that they're doing, both in the formal curriculum and in the informal curriculum. And I think it's our job as educators to build in those opportunities through the curriculum to have the students pause, reflect, make meaning on what they're learning in a moment of time. And that enables us to really build and, and articulate those stories of who we are as professionals. And so you see a couple of examples here. Um, the top one is from uh, our friends at Stanford University. We use them a lot because they're doing really good work there, Helen Chen and her colleagues. Um, I love Joshua's um, portfolio here because you can see he's used a three word story to identify who he is as a professional, a composer, a storyteller, a researcher. And then he's tied the evidence in his portfolio to those aspects of the narrative that he's constructed for himself. Um, in the bottom uh, example, this is one of my former students, Thyra uh, Calvert. Um, and I used to talk to the students all the time about, you know, it's really important to understand who we are as researchers, as readers of the material, so that we can ask critical questions about why, and this was a history class, why do I understand the past in the way that I do? Why is my definition, in this case, it was a history of family class, why is my definition of family different than my colleagues. And so I was thrilled when um, her portfolio came in um, and she had added a page to the portfolio. I'd given them a template to follow. Um, she added this understanding thyself section and documented for me how she was taking um, and internalizing the material from the course and then, you know, having it come out in service of the work that she wanted to do in the future as a professional. So that was really, um, I think it's a powerful example of how this can happen when we scaffold it for the students in our programs. So what's your story of professional identity development? As I mentioned already, I often start with core values. Renee Brown has a great core values exercise from her Dare to Lead book, um, you know, where we can really start to hone in on what are the things that are most valuable to us and how do we ensure that they're really at the heart of all of the work that we do. I think it's a really um, incredible um, activity to participate in because it really does force us. If she actually, actually makes you identify two core values, which seems very difficult, but you know, as you work through the exercise, you can find that there are usually categories or buckets of, of um, values that go together. And so identifying your core values and then thinking about how you might generate evidence of learning that align with the core values, but also with the professional competencies um, or the learning outcomes that you're wanting to, to demonstrate. So I think this, this piece about self-awareness is so important. We really need to practice this. And I would say that's true for all of us um, because in becoming more self-aware, we gain some ownership of our reality. And I think, you know, one of the things that I, I see my students struggle with and I struggled with myself is what is my professional identity? I've mentioned that I was trained as a historian. I got into faculty development, teaching and learning early on in my graduate school career. And I wrestled for a really long time. Am I a faculty developer? Am I a professor? Who am I? Am I supposed to be doing history, e-portfolios? Where do I fit? And the reality is once I identified those core values, really stepped back and reflected on the variety of experiences that I've had throughout the learning career, I could identify that professional plan that was very aligned with the vocation that I mentioned earlier. And so I think for our students, encouraging them to make some time and space for this, and in fact, building it into the curriculum is really essential. And I think because we're all so busy, I feel like 
um, you know, the world just keeps getting busier and not, and not slowing down. We really need to build in that time and space for reflection and self-awareness into our various programs. So I really want to encourage you to tell your story to hopefully you've been taking some notes and thinking about what are my core values and what story would I want to tell about my own learning and my professional identity. And, you know, you might consider in this case, if we're talking about the pharmacist, um, you know, the different buckets or categories that we might want to capture the evidence from. So in terms of professional practice, that might be our own statements of professional practice or a professional mission statement could be evidence. We might want to have an ethics uh, statement. Um, CPD certificates for sure, but also evidence of what we're taking away from those various CPT opportunities so that if there's something concrete and evidentiary about it, not just um, I did it. Um, the different personal skills that we develop, our organizational and management skills, you know, so these are just some examples um, and ideas about the types of evidence that you might generate to document learning and professional identity. But it could look very different from you depend for you depending on your context and for our students, providing them with some uh, primers around the kinds of evidence that they might want to generate and of course, we're asking them to generate evidence of learning all the time in their various activities and assignments, but we often don't label it as such. And so I think also being really explicit um, and having those conversations with our students as partners about what should the evidence look like in the context of this course or program can be really important. And I think um, often results in ideas about evidence that we don't think of because I am not a student anymore. I don't know what it's like to be in their shoes. And so I think having their voice at the table is super, super important. So our story um, is a big giant box of puzzle pieces and we get to choose um, how we bring those various pieces together. And you, as we've mentioned already, might have multiple portfolios for different audiences and different purposes. I think once you have that, um, you know, collection of evidence, then it gives us that ability to curate the evidence in different ways, um, depending on um, what the audience is really looking for. As Kathy said, employers often now are looking for thin portfolios. So it's also engaging in that practice of reflecting and connecting what it is we've done over the course of our career and how we can pull out the various pieces that would be meaningful, not only for ourselves, but also to a particular audience so that we can demonstrate that we've met the their needs. So in terms of the, phar the pharmacists in the room, you know, what do those core competencies tell us about our identities? And then how do we represent that learning in a way that the professional body will enable um, us to get, you know, accredited and to maintain our uh, accreditation? And then how does that um, kind of grow and change over time? Uh, I like that idea a lot. So um, really just encourage you to tell your story. Um, I think we are the most important piece of the puzzle that we have that goes into our story. And the more you can leverage your experience, your knowledge, your abilities, your skills in the service of your portfolio development and enable those values and that story to really help you to identify the evidence that will be compelling to um, your audiences is um, what I hope you'll think about in terms of your own professional growth moving forward. Thank you. To suggest that we move on um, because we are really trying to protect some time at the end for closing reflections, closing comments, particularly from Tracy and from Kathleen. So I think Katrina is there. So the next two presentations are from Alex, who you met, is on screen, and Lane. So the first one, and in sequence, this is the logical sequence to present these. I want to emphasize before Katrina hits the go button that it has been an absolute privilege and absolutely demanding to try and live up to the role of preceptor to Lane and Alex. And I want to make it absolutely clear that while Johnny and I tried to scaffold uh, Alex and Lane, particularly in the first four or five weeks, of the placement for the last few weeks and in preparing for this, we have kept saying to them, do whatever you believe you want to do. So these really are from Lane 
and from Alex and full credit to them. And I hope you enjoy them. We're going to keep at least five minutes after the two videos and play for questions. So I really do encourage people to reflect on the two videos and come in and, and ask questions or provide feedback as you choose. Hi, I'm Lena Brea. I'm a fourth year pharmacy student at Trinity College doing a four month placement with academic practice. And today I'm going to speak about my exploration of e-portfolios and consider the challenges and benefits in implementing them for a competency based assessment. Three and a half years into my degree, I think I have a good idea of what it's like for students. The pharmacy curriculum is very dense and demanding in terms of content. And because of this, I feel like students don't really get the chance to think about why or how they're learning because we're so focused on the what portion of it. The core competency framework is a set of competencies that any pharmacist in Ireland must demonstrate in order to be registered. Um, it covers a range of behaviours and skills, but in particular it places emphasis on reflecting on practice and lifelong learning. This term I'm assessed against this framework uh, by my preceptor who makes sure I tick off each item on the list, but from my findings on e-portfolios I propose that they could be a better alternative or supplement to this. To me, I think the biggest challenge with e-portfolios is getting students to engage with them in a way that's unlike a traditional written assessment or assignment. If they're being used for summative assessments or for accreditation, I think there's this risk that students will base their artifacts or reflections on what they think the assessor wants to hear. And so the portfolio doesn't really become a true representation of themselves or their learning. In terms of technology, if the technology is too structured or scaffolded, again, students will start to feel like they're just doing another written assignment. But on the other hand, if it's not scaffolded enough, st students will waste their time trying to figure out little technical bits and it takes away from the true essence of e-portfolios, which is a space to reflect and integrate your learning. We also can't assume students are able to reflect to a high standard if I were to look back on my reflections from previous years, I'm sure they'd be very superficial and it's only through doing this placement and looking at topics like e-portfolios that I've been able to reflect on a deeper level. If used correctly, I think e-portfolios would give students the opportunity to track their learning over time and integrate their knowledge learned within college, outside of college and also on placements. Uh, they would also help us develop the reflecting skills we need and represent our CPD throughout the placement. And we could also take sections of these e-portfolios and use them in future job interviews, help us stand out in the process. And they'd also prepare us for keeping our e-portfolios that we're legally obliged to keep when we practice after graduation. From my findings, I think implementing an e-portfolio approach to the current pharmacy curriculum would include the following. Before students can start making their own e-portfolios, they have to be brought up to speed on what e-portfolios are, what they can gain from them, what the purpose of them is, and how to reflect on a deeper level. We should also be supported and guided through how to make different types of artifacts, whether those are written or digital ones. Any rubrics that are developed should be given to students early on in the process so that we can use them to guide our e-portfolio making. And I think it's important that these rubrics don't mark students down for including details of errors, but they should reward students for reflecting and learning from these experiences. And I think in doing this, you get rid of some of that performative behavior that I mentioned earlier. The structure of the e-portfolios should be linked to the core competency framework because this is what's being assessed. I think it should also be linked to the e-portfolio requirements of the Irish Institute of Pharmacists, but at the same time I think there should be enough freedom for students to personalise them and take ownership of them and therefore take ownership of their learning. And since e-portfolios are 
supposed to be living portals. I think the ePortfolio shouldn't just be confined to the 16 weeks around placement, but they should tie in with ePortfolios from other years of the degree and also with what students do in the second term of fourth year. As a future pharmacist, fingers crossed, uh, it's not just important what I learn, although that is important, but I think it's just as important why I learn and how I learn and how this shapes my professional identity and improves my ability to serve society. And I think ePortfolios, given that I truly engage with them and the process of making them capture all of this. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Katrina. So this is Alex, who is an undergrad student at one of the other schools of pharmacy, Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. And I think it just emphasizes that in the role as preceptor experiential student relationship, it actually doesn't matter what institution any of the three of us is from. Hi there, I'm Alex McKibben Driscoll and I'm following on from my peer on placement lane. My presentation is going to focus on showing you into my ePortfolio. It's by no means finished in the sense that we're only midway through our 16 week placement. But to be honest, I suspect that it never really will be finished as when we're fully qualified pharmacists, we are expected through legislation to upkeep um, a portfolio that demonstrates that we are upkeeping with our lifelong learning and our continuing professional development. So I might as well show it to you now. At the start of our community of inquiry into ePortfolios, I did suspect or assume that we would be mapping it on to the three domains that we are expected to demonstrate in our fourth year placement. So that is professional development skills, personal skills and organization and management skills. However, when I did put that into practice, I found it quite concrete and a bit abstract. And so my portfolio as a student owned portfolio took on its own shape. Um, and so I'm going to take you through it now and show you my plans to develop it in the future. So welcome into my ePortfolio. I have divided it into the home page an about page and a project page. Now I will take you through each of them individually. From the educationalist, I learned that ePortfolios are a personal learning space and the type of ePortfolio one creates really depends on what their creator intends it to be used for. So I wanted mine to function as an ever adapting cover letter. So for example, today's event, I want to say who I am, a picture of who I am, where I am, why I'm here and who I'm with to act as an introductory slide almost to this presentation. And then at the bottom of my cover letter style homepage, I have a quick link to my CV. Moving on to the about page, a challenge that I had in this about section was how much do I include about myself? Do I want it to strictly suit my placement or do I want it to be an all encompassing about page that includes my personal skills and hobbies? I decided that I wanted to keep it strictly professional and so it just contains my work experience relevant to healthcare and my university education so far. Moving on to the project page, it has completed projects and projects that are still ongoing as I am only halfway through my placement. So here we have the graduate teaching assistant module. It contains short, snappy, synoptic, reflective sentences pertaining to what I did and the hard skills and the soft skills that I developed from it. So from the graduate teaching assistant module, there's an artifact and there's evidence backing up what I say. So for example, here is a mind map from my peer and I's presentation to the academic practice team. Moving on to this ongoing project, the Community of Inquiry into ePortfolios for today's event. I have all of my ePortfolio reviews that led up to the creation of this ePortfolio. I have an advertisement for today's event and a place where I want to put a recording of today's event. 
And then lastly, professional identity formation. Specifically with this project, um, a 2020 review in the International Journal of ePortfolios stated that if not reflected upon, the learning process ceases to exist beyond the creation of the original work sample. And I really found this to be true. And so I contained a reflection on my feelings towards professional identity formation at the start or the induction of my placement. And here I have um, a resource I created for pharmacy students related to professional identity formation as I felt there wasn't one specifically yet for pharmacy students. And here is an artifact from my time as a teaching assistant in the School of Pharmacy. And that has been my ePortfolio so far. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. So thank you for watching that brief glance into my ePortfolio. I hope that you can see that without us having created a community of inquiry to upskill our education theory and methods, I really wouldn't have been able to create an ePortfolio. I wouldn't have known what went into one or even how it could relate to me as a pharmacy student on placement and the use the reflections would have in consolidating and encapsulating my learning so far. And so in being guided by this theory, I was able to create an ePortfolio that will now hopefully stay with me throughout my professional career as a pharmacist. Thank you very much. Wonderful, Alex and Lane. I, I, I'm speaking for myself as though I could speak for someone else. Um, I, I, I mean, I think that's the challenge, but I, but I, so let me, I know you're, you're, so the, the quick answer, Cicely, is that I heard the same, I heard the same and watched the same videos you did. So I, came up with something in the same questions. Some of what I, so the idea, Lane talked about um, a true representation of learning. And the true representation of learning was pitted against, uh, and Lane, correct me if I'm wrong, um, what you call per performative behavior. And I, you know, I think that's a really, really wonderful way of, expressing the conundrum that I think all educators find themselves in. Sorry about the syntax. Um, I mean, on the one hand, performative behavior is not altogether bad. Uh, if I get in a plane, I want the pilot to do the things that pilots are supposed to do. That is performative behavior. So please check all your gauges, make sure we have gas in the airplane tank. And you know that sort of thing. Uh, on, the, on the other hand, uh, um, I'd, I would actually like the, the pilot to be a thoughtful pilot and to have learned from his or her mistakes. Uh, and what, what exactly do you learn? I, I mean, I'll give you a quick example. A friend of ours is in fact a pilot um, and it, it, it's a long story I, and I'm happy to share the details later. It, it was actually published in the Wall Street Journal. He was flying, this sounds totally improbable, but it's true. He was flying a load of lobsters across North America and literally 27 feet of one of the wings fell off. Well, you know what you're not gonna do when you lose that much wing? You're not gonna fly. So he, and it's Canada. I mean, I love Canada, but you know, he's like at Saskatchewan. You know what you have in Saskatchewan? Nothing, farmland. It's a lovely place, but it's a lot of farmland. So it's great for the breadbasket, not good for, you know, other things like, like having a big airport. Long story short, he was not the pilot. He was the co-pilot. The pilot actually, this sounds improbable. It's totally true. The pilot actually <laughs> passes out. So he has to land the plane, which he does. Okay. Now, his reflection on this, as you might imagine, took a somewhat religious term because he was glad to be alive. So he went to church right away. But, but the other thing is he, he learned about himself as a pilot. He learned about the skill set that he had to call on. So there was a lot of learning there. Now, my assumption is to get back to, you know, pharmacy is, does that, is that kind of learning included or showcased in the portfolio that pharmacists create, the ones that are reviewed every five years? So lifelong learning here um, seems to me to be really important. We heard about lifelong learning from both Alex and Lane. There, I mean, Alex was very specific about, I see this portfolio as setting me up for the future. Uh, Lane was very specific about, I see this portfolio as presenting the option for me to think about myself as a lifelong learner now. 
The challenge I would share with us is to think about how lifelong learning and life-wide learning might play important, fundamental, influential roles in an undergraduate and graduate portfolio that is intended to foster reflective practice for a professional. That's what I would say. If there was one thing you would encourage us to implement, what would it be? So Lane, could you come in first and then perhaps Alex? Yeah. For me, from learning about e-portfolios and also from all the, the other activities that I've done as part of my placement, I think something I really valued were those very explicit opportunities to take part in reflection and being prompted to do reflection and how this reflection plays a part in what I'm learning right now and what I'm going to do in the future with the rest of the placement or with the rest of my course. And I think reflection is something that's very assumed with, especially undergraduate students. You kind of just tell them, go reflect on this and then you don't really hear much about it afterwards. And I think if you were to implement very concrete points in a module or a course where you would ask students to reflection to reflect and discuss these reflections with, with older students and with lecturers or, or preceptors. I think that would be a very valuable thing for them. Great. Thank you very much, Lane. Um, wonderful. Alex, are you there? Hi. Um, yeah, well, of course, I do agree with what Lane said. Um, and then another point that I had from my point of view is not to sound like overly practical, but I do like to see the value in things I do. Like I want a thing to take home with me. And from this, the portfolio is something to take home. Um, last year, we had our interviews for a placement. And one of my placements, uh, an interviewer asked me about a project I'd done and like, what did I learn from it or what could have gone better? And it was most such an embarrassing moment in my life because I really had no project that I could that I'd given the time to reflect on before and I literally just had to say to them I don't have an answer for you um because I'd never reflected on projects after I did them I did them when they were done and that was it whereas this gives you the opportunity to do that and it really prepares you for real world um situations I feel wonderful thank you both very much so myself and Lisa Donaldson, my esteemed colleague, are going to talk to you today about student perspectives on learning. So to continue that theme, here we are. Um, I work as head of open education in DCU, which is uh, looks after all of our online programs. And Lisa is a fabulous learning technologist and e-portfolio, I think self-appointed e-portfolio champion, perhaps, Lisa. Yeah, it's the title that I've chosen. There, there, there are others, other names people call me, but yes. We'll yeah, go I, I think we should. I think it's a great job title. It should be a job title. So we're delighted to talk to you here today. Um, and and I suppose while, while we're here, I'm going to plug ePortfolio Ireland, although you've seen some of our resources in the chat earlier. But myself and Lisa are half of, I suppose, slightly less than half of the ePortfolio Ireland steering group so we're a professional learning network um it used to be kind of of higher ed professionals but it's really broadened out there's further ed there's second level so really we're happy to welcome anyone who'd like to join us in our in, in our events we've professional learning we've we like to take on projects like the ebook uh the, the create-a-thon recently there in partnership with able um, so there's our website and uh, very welcome to anyone to come along. And we have some resources on there as well. You can take a look at um, our current one of our current projects is a, a special issue on ePortfolio. So the first batch of articles was published during the summer and the second are just about to come out. So, so there's uh, eight more articles coming out hopefully by the end of November. We've just finished the copy editing of them. And this morning I was starting to think about the editorial. So, so Lisa, that's on our to-do list as well. 
Um, so we're delighted with this. This is a kind of a big step forward for us. So it, we'll have a, a sum total of 12 uh, articles, mainly on ePortfolio in Ireland. But we actually have a few friends from further afield. There's two from Canada and one from Germany as well. And I think, Tracy, you probably know some of the Canadians. It's a, a big crew from Athabasca led by Deborah Hoven. And they have a lovely article coming out about their study about Canadian universities' use of ePortfolio. Um, so that's forthcoming and we, we're hoping to have a launch. So you may get an invitation to that too. Um, just to give you a flavor of our article in the special issue. So myself, Lisa, Tom and Karen Buckley did a study about what was happening in Ireland in terms of ePortfolio. Um, because one thing we found through our practice, there was very little evidence or, or research about what was happening in Ireland. So we conducted a study uh, to try and find out how were people using ePortfolio, um, how are they supporting it, what kind of technology were they using, what were their experiences, um, and how are they getting on implementing, oh, sorry, implementing ePortfolio in their institutions. So this is the result of this. This is just a few little pieces of, of the data. The levels of adoption there were interesting. So we use the framework uh, from, I think it's from the Einan and Gambino book about stages of adoption. So you could see most people thought that we were there at quite early stages of adoption. In terms of what were what were people using portfolio for, the things you think they would they would be. So assessment was big, placement was big, reflective learning. Um, one thing that was starting to grow was was uh, academic teaching and professional staff using it to collect evidence of their learning also. So their professional learning. So that's an interesting growth area. Also some other areas that are kind of new uh, in terms of, uh, so co-curricular areas that was definitely starting to come up peer learning. So some new interesting ones, um, emerging areas. So that will be published in the next week or two. You can check it out. To bring this more back to fo uh, focus on students and away from the kind of broader Irish context, just like to highlight two other articles that may be of interest. The, the one there, the top one in, in distance education is my own. And that was actually my PhD research on ePortfolio based in Trinity College. So to continue the web of Trinity College. Um, and I followed a group of online students for a year learning with an ePortfolio. So that very much captures their experience. And some of the things Lane and Alex were saying resonated with me there. One thing I really loved about their portfolio is my students and Lane and Alex's. I love the visual evidence. I love how people document their lives. And you can see there the quote um, that I used from a student in the title. I'm not simply learning about my uh, learning and regurgitating information. I'm learning about myself. And that still sticks with me. And the other one is a kind of a history of portfolio that I wrote recently. That might be a nice introductory article. So that's enough about us. Over to you now. So I, I'm going to do a few little polls uh, using Vivox. So I'm going to just stop sharing. Uh, and I'm going to put this link in the chat. So you can open this in your browser. And really, it's just some reusing some of the questions from the study as well. Because one thing we found, which we, we thought was like a standout finding, is that very few people were evaluating their practice. Almost no one. Uh, and that struck us as interesting because... How can you learn if, you, if you're not actually evaluating your practice? So hang on, let me just get this presenting. Is everyone managing to open that link? Give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Yep, that's fine. Excellent. <clears throat> so you should see this one. Oh, I see 16. That's great. Two of 16. Hopefully we'll get a fabulous word cloud now. That's what I'm hoping for. It's going up and down, which is odd. <laughs> Somebody's very unsure. 11, 12, 11, 12. Okay, I'm going to press the stop button. Uh, now. Okay, let's see what we have. 
professional. Look at that coming out. Accreditation. Yes. So that's very much the pharmacy angle. Yep. Documenting practice cautiously. Oh, that's that's a nice one there. Well, it, it is a new thing. So caution is normal at the start. Self-assessment. Lovely. OK, another question now. How are you supporting students? Now, I'm aware there's some students, so I'm sorry, you can't you can't talk about supporting yourself, but you could perhaps talk about how you've been supported. Okay, so we're at about 9.10 there. Um, one second, and then I'm going to press stop. Hopefully we get a nice, another nice word cloud. Interview, reflection, evidence, prompts. And, and I heard both Lane and Alex talk about how they had really got experience of reflection, and that's been consistently what we've experienced here as well. You need to, you need to give people support on how to do reflection. Videos, feedback, guidelines, memories. Memories is an interesting one. I'd be curious about what that means if you want to put it in the chat. Exemplar is very important. Lisa's curated really great exemplars here. You might get a chance to show them, Lisa. Okay, next poll. What professional learning related to ePortfolio have you done? And this came up very strongly in, um, in, our, in our article, but actually the one about Canada, that came up as a big finding the need for more professional learning in this area. So I'd be curious there about what, what, what you have experienced. Is it informal or is it sessions like one today? National forum ones? Is it local ones? Is it ePortfolio Ireland? I'm hoping a big ePortfolio Ireland comes up, but, I, but you never know. Okay, I'm going to stop it there. Webinars. Of course, it's lots and lots of webinars. Research. Absolutely. Moodle Munch. Oh, yeah. Moodle Munch is great as well. Training. Seminar. Institutional Able. There we go. Beautiful. And then the very last, I promise, and then I'm going to hand over it to my esteemed colleague. Have you evaluated your ePortfolio practice? Again, picking up on just the fact that we noticed that Many people self-reported that they didn't evaluate their practice. Lisa's, you, you've got, you're actually doing an evaluation at the moment, Lisa, aren't you? We are mid-evaluation as we speak. Yeah, that's it. But that's our second, isn't it? Second institutional evaluation. You did one about immediately after the pilot year. So, but that was four years ago. So it was did it? take us. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, look at all the no's. Advanced HE, yeah. But was that an advanced HE? Oh, yeah, I suppose. Yeah, it was of your practice, though, probably in a professional capacity. In process. Okay, that's interesting. Okay. Now, I'm just going to switch that. Okay, Lisa, it's over to you now. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. So I'm just going to share screen. And get to the right box. Okie dokie. So thank you, Orna, and thanks for setting the scene for kind of the national context. What I really want to do here is bring it back to a more local, um, a local view of how ePortfolio is being used within the DCU community. Um, so I wanted to share just a couple of things with you, and hopefully I did tick the box for this, um, because I really want to play this video for you. And I will talk over it as it's playing. Can everybody hear the backtrack? So these are some brief examples of our students' portfolios that they entered into our annual showcase competition. 
And what it will do is give you a bit of an insight to the variety of uses, the variety of media, and the different approaches that students took to develop their e-portfolio. just going to pause it there because I'm very conscious of our timeline this evening. But uh, I just wanted to give you just a flavor of some of the incredible e-portfolios that our students have uh, shared with us and gave us permission to share here today. Um, with regard to e-portfolio and DCU, we probably have one of the most, um, I suppose, it, elongated relationships with ePortfolio uh, of a lot of institutions. We invested in ePortfolio back in 2016 with a, a pilot program using the Mahara uh, platform. And all the way through to now currently, you can see over time the huge growth and interest in ePortfolio. And I do have to say that, of course, COVID would have been uh, a bit of a tipping point, really, for ePortfolio practice here in DCU, as our lecturers, as well as everybody else uh, globally, really were seeking out alternative methods to assess students and to allow them to demonstrate their skills and their um, knowledge. So just to give you a bit of background on how we support up to 15,000 students across DCU now to use the ePortfolio. I'm going to talk specifically around eTerns, who are our student um, interns who help uh, roll out, support students, um, and promote ePortfolio across the institution. Um, eTerns have been a, an incredible help to the program. But we also offer a comprehensive help for all of our students and for all of our staff. Um, and these resources have been built up over time, including, as you saw, some of those sample portfolios, which can really, I suppose, serve to inspire uh, students when often the concept, and that came out in, in a comment earlier, the concept of why people are using or, or, or lecturers are requesting students to use ePortfolio, there needs to be an understanding around the why. Um, and oftentimes that is missing. So we've attempted to overcome that with a huge wealth of resources. Um, and in our institution, I am the dedicated champion to support ePortfolio. Uh, and I, I would recommend having somebody to be that person, to be the face of ePortfolio, to support lecturers and to work with st staff and students, um, because that, we found that really helpful. But just to speak more briefly about the uh, eTurn programme, the eTerns are the heart and soul of our program. Um, I am but one person and the students are really able to use the channels that other students work across. And there is nothing like um, being helped by a peer, in my opinion. So they are the heart and soul of Loop Reflect. I have a very, very brief video here that I just want to share before I hand over the reins to Ruby, who is here with us and who is one of our current ePortfolio um, eTerms. So I'm just going to press play on this. In art this year, we had an art journal. We are the second year B.Ed student and I was one of the Loop eTerms with... Me, I'm Neve, and I was the second year B.Ed and I'm also a Loop eTerm. Um, we're just, we were talking about the benefits that we found as students for using Loop Reflect for assessment. And I found that it just opens up so much more opportunities for using different types of media for your assessment. Like any time in art this year, we had an art journal and we had to stick in pictures of the process of what we were making. But our last uh, lecture that we had, we had to do a claymation video. And obviously we couldn't stick a video into a physical art journal. We had to take one or two pictures from it that we thought kind of captured the whole claymation in itself. Whereas using the ePortfolio, I can just upload that directly and you can get the full effect of the claymation video in itself. So I found that that's really, really helpful using Loop Reflect. And also my technology skills have just gone sky.
skyrocketed this year because of it and I apply all those skills over to kind of other aspects of my uh, college. Um, I found that it made a lot more sense for me to put my reflections up with videos and pictures as well. Just I felt that it kind of brought it to life a bit more and also I could kind of structure it in the way that I wanted instead of like as an academic essay or anything. I found it a lot easier to do. The part that I found really helpful was the uh, rubric. I was given a rubric in first year with like exactly what I needed to have in the portfolio. So then I knew that I was hitting all the points and that I was making sure that I got everything in. So I found it very easy to follow that way. I also think we're really lucky in the B Ed course. They've rolled it out very well that they've built a culture around the e portfolio that I didn't even notice it was a new thing when I came in in first year because everyone was mentioning it in our lectures like, oh, if you take pictures of this, you can put it on your e-portfolio. Oh, if you video this, you can put it on your e-portfolio. And I think that's one of the main things that we need to tackle in order to get people on board with e-portfolios. It's just building that culture and it does take work, but it's so worth it in the end because then everyone's so encouraged and really motivated to actually try it out in the end. So some words from previous e-turns about their experiences of working with the e-portfolio across the Bachelor of Education programme. Um, just a little bit about the e-turn e programme itself. Uh, and you're able to read through um, those points on, on the screen uh, as, as I'm talking. But the the e-turns, I, I said they're their heart and soul. They, they work with me. They work with other students and they have a number of roles in helping to support um, all students across the institution in using ePortfolio. And I'm using this as a bit of an introduction to Ruby, who is hopefully here and uh, ready to just say a few words. Uh, I would I would just give um, uh, let you know that Ruby is was having some uh, technical difficulties with regards to her screen. So hopefully she'll be able to to share her insights, because with this piece, we really want you to, to hear from as many of our students as possible. So uh, Ruby, over to you. Are you able to take the mic? Yeah, perfect. My screen, I have another, you see the flash in there, that's what's happening over there. But I'm onto this one now. Um, so yeah, thank you, Lisa. Um, so my name is Ruby and I'm a third year studying education and training. Um, I began using Loop Reflect um, and ePortfolios in my first year in DCL. And as Lisa said, I'm recently an e-turn, which where I help to promote the use of learning portfolios and I help other students with creating their own. Um, at the beginning, I didn't really understand what creating an ePortfolio really meant, but uh, because of COVID, I had a lot of time to mess around with the platform, and any questions I had in it were made available at the resource page um, that Lisa shown the comprehensive help, which is really good scaffolding to help with my learning with that. Um, but in general, my, my experience with creating my portfolio has been really positive. I find that it's in a unique way to present evidence of my work. And even as Alex mentioned earlier, um, something to take home with you. So kind of something to really be proud of. Um, and I also really enjoy making them because it allows me the ability to be creative with how I'm presenting my work, with the layout, the design, and also with the range of media I'm able to upload. Um, and I also felt that these factors made me a lot more engaged with the process, like it encouraged me to keep going. It kind of made me a bit excited with what, how I was laying out my work. Um, and also one thing about my experience with ePortfolios is that I'm always revisiting them. So, and I didn't really think, I thought I'd make them and I'd have them there and they'd just stay there, but I keep revisiting them. So for interviews or even presentations that I'm doing, I will go back and look at what I've written and either pull from it or use it as inspo. And um, because you do forget what you have been involved with and what you've kind of thought about and what you've reflected on. So I found that really, really good. So for like example, I had to do an interview and I used the information on my portfolio to kind of get prepared for it. Um, because I had documented different times that I'd used the leadership skills or how I was with working in a team. Um, but with my experience of being in the term, although I'm only new to it, um, it's been really beneficial as a student teacher um, because it's shown me how using a digital platform allows you the flexibility and creativity to enhance digital learning and engagement with students. Um, and even when I was saying the quote from a student just there about like regurgitating information, like sometimes it's like how useful that can that be. But I find reflecting on my experiences, I learn so much. 
um, and that's what ePortfolios really does for me. Um, but overall, my experience with creating ePortfolios has been really positive, and I'm really looking forward to creating more and helping promote the use of them to other students and the benefits. Thank you, Ruby. That's absolutely brilliant. And, and those are exactly the messages that we're, we're trying to get across to students that this, the, the, that ePortfolio practice is um, the benefits far um, outlast the development of creating a single page for a module, that it, it really goes beyond. And uh, as, as Ruby said, there is something that can be a benefit to the future as well. So thanks a million, Ruby. Um, in, in keeping with the theme, I want to leave the last word to yet another of our uh, students. And uh, Iman is a student etern with us as well and has been for the last two years. Um, so I will just leave Ruby or leave Iman with the final word. Ah, maybe I won't leave Iman with the final word. My video doesn't play. Ah, it was one minute um, from, from Iman there. Apologies for that. Anyway, at that point, hopefully what Orna and I, Orna and I have shared with you is simply, uh, I suppose, the, the landscape view of ePortfolio practice in Ireland, as well as uh, a deeper delve into how our students are using the ePortfolio within Dublin City University. So thank you for listening. To keep to time here, and we did say at the beginning that we would leave the last word, call them reflections, whatever you choose, to Tracy and Kathleen. And um, before I, I hand over to them to thank everybody, every single one of the speakers, it has uh, really set us all thinking in so many different directions about ePortfolios. And of course, to our host, Katrina and Jade and all those uh, in the academic practice team in TCD as well. Tracy and Kathleen, do it as a discussion, whatever you choose. Well, I think just to pick up on what you just said, Cicely, it, it, there are a variety of, um, you know, ideas and practices and perspectives that we've heard about today. And it, it brings me back to, you know, sort of planning and the purpose of the portfolio. And so really thinking about in your context, what do you want to achieve by having the students document their learning and then bringing, um, you know, something that Lane and Alex and I think Ruby all alluded to is really building in those explicit opportunities to be reflective um, about learning, to capture the learning and also um, to make it sensible for the students, you know, why, why am I doing this? And, and I think that is important for our colleagues as well. Um, no one wants to take up a practice just because someone thinks it sounds fun. Um, it should, should have a very clear um, purpose in, in our work and um, really just, I think to echo one of the E-turns from DCU, also enables us to make explicit the various skills that come about as a result of building a portfolio that may not be explicitly tied to the learning outcomes, but augment them in, in wonderful and sometimes magical ways that we wouldn't expect. Fantastic. Kathleen? I think I would, I would build on that. I've got four quick points and really I'm drawing um, um, what everyone has said here today. Um, so one, I think the idea of the portfolio as um, an archive, an archive of um, texts, of artifacts, uh, of memories for that matter, that the fact that that archive is available uh, not only means, as Alex put it, that you have something to hold on to, that as Ruby said, uh, echoing Alex, something to take home, but, but also something that you can revisit. And it does act as a site of reflection um, and a kind of reflection that Lane spoke to when she asked us about the differences between performative assessment and actually the, the way we learn. So there's something here that's powerful about a portfolio archive that is, is a collection in and of itself. A second point I thought that was made that, that was really important um, that both Orna and Lisa spoke to had to do with the idea of support. That if we're going to engage in e-portfolio work, their supports are going to be needed. Um, they may take different form on different campuses, but at the end of the day, the point of them 
isn't so much just to provide support and resources, it's to inculcate a culture of the portfolios and really I think a culture of reflection. So, the, so in raising questions about support, I think what I'd ask about is how do, how do we create this kind of culture? What are the pieces that we need and what kind of culture do we want? I think if we can do that, um, then, then what we are able to do is present ePortfolio not as a requirement, but as an opportunity. And not only present it that way, but actually mean that that's what it is. But I also think that if we're gonna learn about the kind of um, opportunity it is, then we need to pay attention to our students as they engage in this, but we also need to pay attention to our graduates and as our graduates become full-time employees. How are they making use of this opportunity? What difference has it made to them? I, I think that's, I, because I'll go back to what I said earlier after Lane and Alex spoke, I'm, I'm quite taken with the idea of lifelong learning, which is clearly part of the pharmaceutical model. So if we want lifelong learning, what do we do to put those pieces in place? But also what do we know about it going forward? So it's on us to look into that so that we can speak to that. And the, the last thing I would say um, is simply a big thank you. Uh, I opened my presentation with a thank you um, for the invitation to share this time with you. And I want to close my comments with a thank you for having spent that time with you, because there's no doubt uh, that I'm smarter now than I was three hours ago. Um, and also that I look forward to hearing from you all. I'm thrilled that the recording is available. Uh, and so we can access the resources and, and the slides too, after 24 hours, or now it's probably more like uh, 23, 22. Uh, but those materials are all available and we can share them and think together with them. And my theory is that when you uh, participate in a session like this, that sooner or later down the line, uh, uh, tomorrow or next month or maybe next year, I'll hear about what some of you have done. And, uh, and that will make me even smarter. So for all of that, and for your graciousness and generosity, I say thanks. And from here as well, um, I think that's, this is, this is sort of the epitome of lifelong learning, this community of inquiry that we get to participate in and, and share and reflect and um, collaborate and connect all of our various work. So uh, from here as well, thank you so, so much for the invitation. It was a great session. Well, thank you both very much. And I suppose the aspiration of those of us who probably began to think about e-portfolios as a monster we couldn't grapple with. Um, so our aspiration is that someday we're all going to be worthy members of a community of practice, including you, Tracy, Kathleen, Orna, Ashling, um, and it's patently obvious that our students will, Lane, Alex, Ruby, you are rapidly making use of these concepts in a way that we have so much to learn from you in how things are structured. I'd say all of us will um, agree with that in our relevant institutions. So I think a wonderful day. The recordings will be available. And I thank you all for your time, your engagement, your expertise um, and your support uh, to all of us involved in this. And I suppose to use the French expression au revoir, I hope this is not goodbye, that this is midway in an immediate sort of project for Lane and Alex, but hopefully the beginning of something where we'll interact with the other institutions um, and all of your expertise.